chapter 27, in which Passepartout undergoes, at a speed of 20 miles an hour, a course of Mormon history. During the night of the 5th of December, the train ran southeasterly for about 50 miles, then rose an equal distance in a northeasterly direction toward the Great Salt Lake. Passepartout, about 9 o'clock, went out upon the platform to take the air. The weather was cold, the heavens gray, but it was snowing. The sun's disk, enlarged by the mist, seemed an enormous ring of gold, and Passepartout was amusing himself by calculating its value in pound sterling when he was diverted from this interesting study by a strange-looking personage who made his appearance on the platform. This personage, who had taken the train at Elko, was tall and dark, with black mustache, black stockings, a black silk hat, a black waistcoat, black trousers, a white cravat, and dogskin gloves. He might have been taken for a clergyman. He went from one end of the train to the other, and affixed to the door of each car a notice written in manuscript. Passepartout approached and read one of these notices, which stated that Elder William Hitch, Mormon missionary, taking advantage of his presence on train number 48, would deliver a lecture on Mormonism in car number 117 from 11 to 12 o'clock, and that he invited all who were desirous of being instructed concerning the mysteries of the religion of the Latter-day Saints to attend. I'll go, said Passepartout to himself. He knew nothing of Mormonism except the custom of polygamy, which is its foundation. The news quickly spread through the train, which contained about 100 passengers, 30 of whom, at most attracted by the notice, ensconced themselves in car number 117. Passepartout took one of the front seats. Neither Mr. Fogg nor Fix cared to attend. At the appointed hour, Elder William Hitch rose, and in an irritated voice, as if he had already been contradicted, said, I tell you that Joe Smith is a martyr, that his brother Hiram is a martyr, and that the persecutions of the United States government against the prophets will also make a martyr of Brigham Young. Who dares to say the contrary? No one ventured to gainsay the missionary, whose excited tone contrasted curiously with his naturally calm visage. No doubt his anger arose from the hardships to which the Mormons were actually subjected. The government had just succeeded with some difficulty in reducing these independent fanatics to its rule. It had made itself master of Utah, and subjected that territory to the laws of the Union, after imprisoning Brigham Young on a charge of rebellion and polygamy. The disciples of the prophet had since redoubled their efforts, and resisted, by words at least, the authority of Congress. Elder Hitch, as is seen, was trying to make proselytes on the very railway trains. Then, emphasizing his words with his loud voice and frequent gestures, he related the history of the Mormons from biblical times, how that, in Israel, a Mormon prophet of the tribe of Joseph published the annals of the new religion and bequeathed them to his son Mormon, how many centuries later a translation of this precious book, which was written in Egyptian, was made by Joseph Smith, Jr., a Vermont farmer who revealed himself as a mystical prophet in 1825, and how, in short, the celestial messenger appeared to him in an illuminated forest and gave him the annals of the Lord. Several of the audience, not being much interested in the missionary's narrative, here left the car. But Elder Hitch, continuing his lecture, related how Smith Jr. with his father, two brothers, and a few disciples founded the Church of the Latter-day Saints, which adopted not only in America, but in England, Norway, and Sweden, and Germany, counts many artisans, as well as men engaged in the liberal professions among its members, how a colony was established in Ohio, a temple erected there at a cost of $200,000, and a town built at Kirkland, how Smith became an enterprising banker, and received from a simple mummy showman a papyrus scroll written by Abraham and several famous Egyptians. The elder's story became somewhat wearisome, and his audience grew gradually less until it was reduced to 20 passengers. But this did not disconcert the enthusiast, 
who proceeded with the story of Joseph Smith's bankruptcy in 1837 and how his ruined creditors gave him a coat of tar and feathers, his reappearance some years afterward, more honorable and honored than ever, at Independence, Missouri, the chief of a flourishing colony of 3,000 disciples, and his pursuit thence by outraged genteels and retirement into the far west. Ten hearers only were now left, among them honest Passepartout, who was listening with all his ears. Thus he learned that after long persecutions, Smith reappeared in Illinois, and in 1839 founded a community at Nauvoo on the Mississippi, numbering 25,000 souls, of which he became mayor, chief justice, and general-in-chief. That he announced himself in 1843 as a candidate for the presidency of the United States, and that finally, being drawn into ambuscade at Carthage, he was thrown into prison and assassinated by a band of men disguised in masks. Passepartout was now the only person left in the car, and the elder, looking him full in the face, reminded him that two years after the assassination of Joseph Smith, the inspired prophet Brigham Young, his successor, left Nauvoo for the banks of the Great Salt Lake, where in the midst of that fertile region directly on the route of the emigrants who crossed Utah on their way to California, the new colony, thanks to the polygamy practiced by the Mormons, had flourished beyond expectations. And this, added Elder William Hitch, this is why the jealousy of Congress has been aroused against us. Why have the soldiers of the Union invaded the soil of Utah? Why has Brigham Young, our chief, been in prison in contempt of all justice? Shall we yield to force? Never. Driven from Vermont, driven from Illinois, driven from Ohio, driven from Missouri, driven from Utah, we shall yet find some independent territory on which to plant our tents. And you, my brother, continued the elder, fixing his angry eyes upon his single auditor, Will you not plant yours there, too, under the shadow of our flag? No, replied Passepartout courageously, in his turn retiring from the car and leaving the elder to preach to vacancy. During the lecture, the train had been making good progress, and toward half-past twelve, it reached the northwest border of the Great Salt Lake. Thence the passengers could observe the vast extent of this interior sea, which is also called the Dead Sea, and into which flows an American Jordan. It is a picturesque expanse, framed in lofty crags in large strata encrusted with white salt, a superb sheet of water which was formerly of larger extent than now, its shores having encroached with the lapse of time, and thus at once reduced its breadth and increased its depth. The Salt Lake, 70 miles long and 35 wide, is situated 3 miles 800 feet above the sea, quite different from Lake Asphaltite, whose depression is 1,200 feet below the sea. It contains considerable salt, and one quarter of the weight of its water is solid matter, its specific weight being 1,170, and, after being distilled, 1,000. Fishes are, of course, unable to live in it, and those which descend through the Jordan, the Weber, and other streams soon perish. The country around the lake was well cultivated, for the Mormons are mostly farmers. While ranches and pens for domesticated animals, fields of wheat, corn, and other cereals, luxuriant prairies, hedges of wild rose, clumps of acacias, and milkwort would have been seen six months later. Now the ground was covered with a thin powdering of snow. The train reached Ogden at two o'clock, where it rested for six hours. Mr. Fogg and his party had time to pay a visit to Salt Lake City, connected with Ogden by a branch road and they spent two hours in this strikingly American town, built on the pattern of other cities of the Union like a checkerboard. With the somber sadness of right angles, as Victor Hugo expresses it. The founder of the City of the Saints could not escape from the taste for symmetry which distinguishes the Anglo-Saxons. In this strange country, where the people are certainly not up to the level of their institutions, everything is done squarely. Cities, houses, and follies. The travelers, then, were promenading at three o'clock about the streets of the town built between the banks of the Jordan and the spurs of the Wasatch Range. They saw few or no churches, but the Prophet's Mansion, the courthouse, and the arsenal, blue brick houses with verandas and porches, surrounded by gardens bordered with acacias, palms, and locusts, 
A clay and pebble wall built in 1853 surrounded the town, and in the principal street were the market and several hotels adorned with pavilions. The place did not seem thickly populated. The streets were almost deserted, except in the vicinity of the temple, which they only reached after having traversed several quarters surrounded by palisades. There were many women, which was easily accounted for by the peculiar institution of the Mormons, but it must not be supposed that all the Mormons are polygamists. They are free to marry, or not, as they please. But it is worth noting that it is mainly the female citizens of Utah who are anxious to marry, as according to the Mormon religion, maiden ladies are not admitted to the possession of its highest joys. These poor creatures seem to be neither well-off nor happy. Some, the more well-to-do, no doubt, wore short, open, black silk dresses under a hood or modest shawl. Others were habited in Indian fashion. Passepartout could not behold without a certain fright these women, charged in groups with conferring happiness on a single Mormon. His common sense pitied, above all, the husband. It seemed to him a terrible thing to have to guide so many wives at once across the vicissitudes of life, and to conduct them, as it were, in a body to the Mormon paradise, with the prospect of seeing them in the company of the glorious smith, who doubtless was the chief ornament of that delightful place to all eternity. He felt decidedly repelled from such a vocation, and he imagined, perhaps he was mistaken, that the fair ones of Salt Lake City cast rather alarming glances on his person. Happily, his stay there was but brief. At four, the party found themselves again at the station, took their places in the train, and the whistle sounded for starting. Just at the moment, however, that the locomotive wheels began to move, cries of... Mm. See, I don't know who's voicing this, so I'm just going to wing it. Just at the moment, however, that the locomotive wheels began to move, cries of STOP! STOP! were heard. Trains, like time and tide, stopped for no one. The gentleman who uttered the cries was evidently a belated Mormon. He was breathless with running. Happily for him, the station had neither gates nor barriers. He rushed along the track, jumped on the rear platform of the train, and fell, exhausted, into one of the seats. Passepartout, who had been anxiously watching this amateur gymnast, approached him with lively interest, and learned that he had taken flight after an unpleasant domestic scene. When the Mormon had recovered his breath, Passepartout ventured to ask him politely how many wives he had, for from the manner in which he had decamped, it might be thought that he had twenty at least. One, sir, replied the Mormon, raising his arms heavenward. One, and that was enough. Okay. End of chapter.